introduce Luke Rudowski, who's the founder of We Are Change. Uh, thanks for coming in for the interview, Luke. Appreciate it. I know you've uh, had a, you have jet lag and you've had, had a lot of sleep. You've been very busy, jet setting around the place. Um, let's just kind of go back a bit for the people who don't know We Are Change. Just give us a bit of a history and, and why you put We Are Change together and how it came about. Well, I've been involved in the Netherlands Truth Movement for about eight years now. And in around 2006, I saw not a lot of young people were involved in the movement. So every time I would do events, every time I would give a talk, every time I, would, I was at a protest, I would look for young people and take down their emails who were like-minded. And I had about 200 emails. And then one day, I, you know, every day I used to put them in the, in the computer. One day I decided to call a meeting. And I emailed all the 200 young people I saw, and we met at a pizzeria. And we started meeting every every week and talking. We didn't have a name, we didn't have an organization. This was in 2006, late 2006. And uh, slowly but surely, uh, we came up with a name, we came up with a concept, we came up with an idea. And in 2007, early 2007, uh, it just kicked off. And uh, it was like a fire that was lit. And there was nothing stopping us. And uh, we were able to do a lot of amazing things. My first video was the Zbigniew Brzezinski interview, and my second video was a police officer saying I was a terrorist and I had a backpack bomb because he didn't like my message and he was framing me. Okay. And because of that video, he got fired. So after those two videos came out, they were very popular and uh, everything just went off from there. Brilliant, it went viral. And, you know, let's go back to how you found out about, you know, what was going on. How did you open up to it? What went, well, well what just, was just growing up in Brooklyn, I hung out with, I don't know, I guess you would say the wrong crowd or just, you know, the, the people that look weird in society, you know, and uh, I got beat up by, cop, by cops one day, and after getting beat up by the police and trying to get justice for it, they told me that they couldn't do anything because there was no video of the incident. And ever since then, I always try to have a video camera on me at all times, no matter what. And it, and it made me question things about what's happening in our society more, especially because the police presence was a lot stronger after 9-11. And it just naturally progressed to that, and I had a friend show me some documentaries, and from there, it just, you know, down the rabbit hole, and there's no coming back. Okay, and your website, We Are Change, has gone global. So do you want to tell us how that came about? I don't know, I wish somebody would tell me how it came about, because... I had no idea how We Are Change grew so rapidly. I mean, uh, we did our thing in New York, and then people in other cities and countries and states and started doing it as well and started calling themselves We Are Change. And I, I didn't know who they were. I never talked to them. I never spoke to them. It was organic. They didn't ask permission. And that was beautiful, and I loved it. I loved how people just said, you know what, I like what you're doing, I'm going to do it too, I'm going to call myself We Are Change as well. I'm not even going to ask you permission to do it. it because it's about the idea, it's about the message. And it was, it, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful, amazing thing, and right now there's about 242 chapters. It's impossible to keep track of all of them, they're all over the world. It's impossible to see everything they're doing, but it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that has grown out of my understanding. I thought it wouldn't go anywhere. That's brilliant. Yeah. And are you concerned though that you might get a chapter um, that are not kind of um, following your philosophy? Yeah. I mean we have a code of conduct and a mission statement that talks about all the general areas so if people violate it of course they won't be a chapter. You can't be racist, you can't be sexist, you can't be hateful, angry, violent, or call for violence. And, you know, we, we very much want to follow the policies of non-violence, peaceful resistance, just like Martin Luther King and Gandhi did it. And we have, you know, the, 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 the rules there that specifically, you know, state you can't be stupid or do anything stupid. Okay, which so, is fair, fair yeah. enough. Now, tell us about your latest trip. Yeah, I mean, I'm here because of the Sovereign Independent flew me into Europe and mm -hmm. I asked them to kind of extend it because I've never been to Europe before and I'm taking advantage of it as much as I can and I went to France, I covered the G8 protest, the protest with, with the Solidarity and uh, with the Spanish Revolution, I was in Barcelona, Spain, uh, slept out in the streets at the camp out with uh, the Plata de Catalunya, I got tear gassed in France really bad. Uh, I went to Bilderberg in Switzerland, 
And uh, it's just been an amazing journey, amazing ride. I've been meeting so many wonderful, beautiful, caring human beings who appreciate the work I do and they've been helping me out by giving me a couch or a floor to sleep on or giving me a car ride to the airport. And it's just been an amazing, incredible journey meeting amazing like-minded people. And I'm finding out more and more that um, everywhere I go, people want the same thing and they're sick of the things that are going on. They're sick of the left, right. They just want to be left alone. They're sick of the bankers' bailouts. They're sick of politicians lying and, and abusing them. And, and uh, it's, it's refreshing to see uh, the same kind of attitudes and feelings that we have in the United States is very much strong here in Europe too. And one thing that we, we have to say, and you have seen it now by coming over to Europe, um, as a person who has traveled myself, you only realize the consistent things that are going on when you go to different countries. Yeah. And you go, hang on, that's happening in that country, and that's happening in that country. Because a lot of people don't travel as much of, as you've been yeah. traveling. And you can see it yourself now from the States and in Europe, what's going on, and similar things. So you, can you tell us roughly what you've been seeing that are yeah. kind of duplicated? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, the main thing that I'm getting out of the, this European tour is, one, the people are sick of the left and right. Mm. Uh, the mainstream media lies to them. And that they're just sick of the bailouts. Mm. Spain had bailouts. Ireland has bailouts. Uh, France and, and uh, Switzerland, I don't believe, had, mm. had bailouts. But they also have their economic problems. And they have a large number of people who are pissed off the way things are going. Mm. And they want to make a difference. They, I've seen uh, mostly a lot of resistors, but also just talking to people randomly in the street. They know something's wrong. They know that they're going in a direction that there is no future for them, or their, or their kids, or themselves even, and they want to do something to affect it, and, and change it, and to stop it, to make, and sure make a change. And what do you see, I mean, I don't know how long you've been here in Ireland, you know, the Irish are very kind of laid back at the moment. If you look at Spain, yeah. you have the people out in the streets protesting, and, they're, and you know, they're making, trying to make a change, yeah. which is great for them. We don't have that in Ireland, it's not happening. Are you kind of thinking, why is this not happening in Ireland? Why aren't people really going out and marching on the streets? Well, I just got into Ireland just a couple of hours ago, so I still really haven't been able to talk to people and communicate with people and get the general vibe here. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, protests sometimes may feel ineffective, mm -hmm. may feel like you're not doing anything or accomplishing anything. What they're doing and what they tried to do in France and what they're doing in Spain is totally different. It's less of a protest as much as a non-compliance with the system where people are coming together, living together, making communities together, supporting themselves. I mean, in Spain, at the Plata de Catalunya, they had their own libraries, they had their own medical center, they had their own Wi-Fi areas, they had their own gardens, they had committees and subcommittees of people who were working together, networking, living together, and moving away from the system instead of fighting the system and also sending a message to the general public that enough is enough and we are here and we're going to be a public and we're going to show the public that you know there's people sleeping on the streets because there's 45 percent unemployment with the youth mm -hmm. and that it, it, we're not gonna we're not gonna comply with the system we're gonna make our own this little system and that's what they're doing uh, that idea I don't know hasn't been prevalent in Ireland but other than just screaming in the streets I don't think that's as effective and I don't think that reaches as many people as, as other ideas and mm -hmm. other effective ways to, to, to change general attitudes and to change uh, public perception so uh, it, it, it's been hard. I know Ireland has been going through a lot of hard times. I know you guys fought and tried to resist the Lisbon Treaty. It, it didn't work, but you guys were successful once, but you got to keep it up. And, and, you know, this war, this information war, it's never going to end unless we all come together and we all wake up. And I, yeah. I think we're going to get there. Somewhere. And that's what we need to do. We need to wake up the people. Yeah. The trip that you've recently been on was in Switzerland, I believe, for the yeah. Blindenberg meeting. Before we talk about your trip, um, for people who don't know the Lindenbergers, do you want to give us an overview of who they are? Yeah, I mean, you know, you don't have to take my word for it, you can just research it yourself, but the Bilderbergers are the kings, queens, uh, politicians, heads of states, bankers, uh, corporate heads, media moguls, and the most influential and powerful people in the world that meet once a year in secret with the protection of the British, Israeli, and American intelligence agencies, and they meet in secret. Some of them even openly brag how they set policy, uh, how they created the Euro, how they made uh, significant changes in our lives at these secret private meetings. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's the the problem is the huge amount of secrecy 
people, these guys aren't going to be shown being there. They use all sorts of techniques with police oppression, police intimidation, but at the same time also setting up walls, having special windows so nobody would see the people coming in. So these are people who are not only afraid of their own shadows, but they're afraid of people knowing that they're there, which means it's very sinister. Uh, luckily, there's moles inside. We actually know what's going to happen the year in advance because of the people who are uh, inside secretly passing along the information to the public, luckily. And throughout the years, this information has been right. And uh, this just shows you the huge amount of influence and power these people have. And there's something significantly important about them that we need to really look into and, and understand to see the whole power structure of the world.